the abandoned buildings. They became a second home for me. The people that I would run into and the things that I would do in those places, just for drugs. It was freezing. We ran out of gas, but side by side, my husband in one of our vehicles and me in the other. And we were covering up ourselves with the mats of the cars. I had vomited on myself. I was wearing the same clothes for weeks. We had been hiding out at a friend's house and the police came, told us to split. And, and, and that's, that's where we ended up. Just dead. The prescription drugs that we really started to take over. I was taking Oxycontin like it was going out of style. I couldn't do anything without using. It's not about getting high anymore, it's just about feeling normal, about avoiding sickness. I was a walking dead person. It's the end of the road, it's, it's slavery. Your whole world, it's all you think about all day long and all night long. Your whole world revolves around the drug. I, I felt like I was in a bottomless pit and I wasn't coming out. My childhood was really nice, and I grew up in, with a family of six, and my mother and my father were educated. They taught us morals and values, we went to church, and that was pretty much it. My parents gave us a lot of love. I grew up in Peoria, Illinois, and I am the eldest of six children. Um, I grew up in um, they had, I guess back then they called them the projects, so I grew up in the projects. I had a great childhood. Um, I have two wonderful parents, a younger sister, I'm the oldest. Um, I couldn't complain. I was very involved in sports. Um, I have tons of friends, um, was involved in a lot of different things. Uh, I couldn't ask for a better childhood. I'm a product of two addicts. My mother and my father both used. Um, my dad was an alcoholic. My mother was a prescription pill user. Uh, so it was a pretty sad household. Growing up in a single parent home um, with a mother who taught me, you know, right from wrong. Because my mother, she, she didn't use drugs and there was no smoking and drinking like constantly going on in my home around me. Um, I was just that kind of kid that needed to prove something. And um, when I found drugs, it helped me. Never really be satisfied in my own skin. When I was high, I was beautiful, I was thin, I was everything that I never was when I was sober. So for me, they were, I used to say it was my happy, my happy pill. You know, it's how I got through the day. It's how I, you know, was who I was. It gave me the courage to, you know, just be the guy that um, I'm normally not. I'm normally not the, uh, you know, the totally out, I'm, I'm an outgoing person, but I'm not the, you know, walk up and start a conversation right away with a girl and, you know, and, you know, ask for a phone number type of stuff like that. And that's what it did for me. It made me have energy, blocked my pain and allowed me to be a super mom, allowed me to get done things, allowed me to maintain organization for a certain amount of time until eventually my life became out of control and unmanageable. When I wasn't high, I just, I was a hermit. I didn't want anyone to see me. I didn't want to be around anybody. You know, I was back to that, you know, I'm not, you know, I'm fat, I'm ugly. Nobody wants to be around me, but the drugs definitely changed that. I just, I felt amazing and I was, I, I can honestly say I was hooked instantly. From that point on, I probably did Percocet every single day 
or some sort of an opiate from that day until I decided to get clean. It was never enough to just do this. It was never enough to just drink alcohol. It was never enough to just smoke weed. I always had to have more and more and more. And um, very quickly, once I discovered like the, the, the Xanax and, and, and the Percocets especially, the opiates were, were what I was, were my drugs of choice. And um, you know, then it led into the Oxycontins. I did whatever it took to get, to be in that world. First it was the bottle, and then it went to, okay, I can get them now. You know, I can, someone can sell me a couple. It went to that. Um, well, never a couple. <laughs> um, but no, it was, it, it, it was too late. I, I had reached a point of no return, you know. And when I started to pop pills, that became, especially Percocet, that became. Um, the other stuff that I would try, it really didn't do, it didn't make me feel the same way that Percocet did. Because I was one of those people that wanted to try everything, every drug. Um, but Percocet was my drug of choice. Let me tell you. It was very easy for me to con the doctor, you know, being able that I knew how to speak the King's English and I knew how to, and I would use my being HIV. I would actually use my being HIV. Oh, you know, this is, oh. So it was quite easy instead of them, you know, okay, well, why don't you come in for a doctor's visit? Why don't we check you out? Oh, it was quite easy for me to get on the phone, you know, and then when they caught on to the game, you know, by the, by the time they catch on to the game, it's too late because now you're off, you know, getting it from the dealer or what have you, who's also using the doctor. When I was in college, I played a lot of sports. I had a lot of pain, a lot of injuries. I also met who became my husband at the time in college. He was a swimmer and a jet skier down in Long Beach Island. And he taught me how to jet ski. All the time that I was jumping waves and acting like a maniac, I was pounding in my spine. So I had a condition like where I herniated all the the lumbar regions of, you know, the lumbar region of all my, those discs. So I had spinal surgery, and that's when I was introduced to Oxycontin. I wouldn't go and, and get heroin. I would rather do the Oxycontins, because in my own head, I felt as though it wasn't as bad. You know, it, they give these to people for, for help, for pain, or, or doctors are able to write prescriptions, and you can go to a drugstore and get them. So I didn't think it was as bad as going to a, a corner in Camden and, um, you know, talking to the cop man and getting, you know, bags or, you know, heroin. I thought that I, I wasn't as bad as they were, yet in reality, I was probably ten times worse. Every day was the same thing over and over again. Wake up, figure out how I'm going to get through the day, how I'm going to get high. Because I was, you know, I was garbage can. I would just do whatever I had, as much as I had. I didn't care about the consequences. So I would say I was probably taking around five or six pills a day, and they weren't a small dose either. They were a pretty potent dose of narcotics that I was putting into my system every single day. So, and then I would take Xanax to go to sleep. So I was a mess. There was a point in active addiction where my husband, and I, and I'll never forget it. He was doing everything, doing his job and taking care of me and taking care of my babies and taking care of my family and taking care of our home and driving me back and forth to the hospital. And he had hurt his neck and he called my doctor and he said, he, we had the same doctor for 10 years and he said, look, I hurt my neck. And my doctor said, well, you try one of Lisa's pain medications. If it works for you, I'll prescribe you some. And that's when like the madness began because he got addicted to my painkillers which made me not have them, which just instantly had our life spiral out of control. Actually, after my father died, we had a yard sale and we sold all of his stuff. And uh, first thing I did was, my brother and I, first thing we did was go and we bought like, 30 or 40 Percocets with the money that we had gotten from our dead father's stuff and then went to the bar and we were drinking to him. My grandmother, who lives with my parents, who um, at the time I was living with, I knew when she got her Social Security check, I knew when she got her pension check, and um, 
I would wait and I would take I would take their money. We would fight over the drugs. We'd fight over my drugs. We got into like a fist fight and, and he split my face open fighting over Oxycontin. And we were at a point where we had moved into like a bigger home and and he was still doing his job and we're still hiding it from the world, but like inside our life, that's what we were doing. We were fighting. Our babies were too little to know and to understand. They're still being cared for. But like we were dying. I mean, and then just more and more different types of drugs like cocaine and crack. You know, like just whatever we could do to make ourselves feel better. And we had a lifetime of savings, stock, you know, money saved, investments. And we spent every dime on drugs. We took every ounce of money we, own, we owned all the way down to my daughter's piggy banks. And, and we spent it. We spent it on drugs. But at this time, I had done so much. And I've done so much to where I felt so guilty about. And particularly with HIV, um, when you use drugs and you drink and you pop in pills, how often do you think you're really going to tell someone, you know, oh, by the way, I'm HIV? I couldn't do anything without using. I had, you know, towards the end of my addiction, it was at the point where I couldn't even get out of bed without having a drink, um, taking something just to be able to make my daughter's lunch or give her a bath or make her bed or just, you know, I thought I was a great mother because I was doing everything that I had to do for my child when in fact I was not a good mother. You know, I was using drugs to do what I was supposed to do. I had run out of, out of the Oxycontin that I was using. Um, and uh, I knew if I went to the hospital that the doctors would give me morphine. And uh, this time when I got there, they, uh, they gave me the morphine, you know, when I first got there and f through the first night. Um, and then they cut it. I thought my appendix had burst, or I thought that I had a terrible stomach flu. I was deathly ill in the hospital over Christmas. Um, detoxing, begging these doctors to give me something. And uh, while my family was home opening presents on Christmas, but that didn't matter to me. What mattered was getting the prescription drugs that I wanted. I wanted the morphine back, or I wanted them to give me Oxycontin. Like, I, I wanted them to give me Dilaudid. I felt like a terrible son that I had resorted to lying to doctors and nurses and my family and parents all all to be able to get high and uh you know this christmas is the time for family and, and giving and here i am doing the most selfish thing possible and i really believe that i hit my bottom um when i could not i remember having the key literally but I just didn't have the energy to put the key in the door because my mind said, take your ass back out there and do what you do best, use. And that's what I did. They, um, they were in their, they were so little and they were like sitting on the couch and I was in the kitchen. You should have seen our kitchen look like it should be on a, um, in a magazine granite countertops, beautiful like cherry wood floors and um, we would like be playing games and smoking crack and sniffing heroin and sniffing ox. It just didn't matter, playing cards and my kids were in another room. They were acting nuts. And it was like I was like, Oh, I wonder if like the smoke is bothering them, like the you know, if, if they're high, you know. I would leave them in their cribs and if they like we're in their diapers and leave them there. And I couldn't get up and take care of them. And they would have like it all, my daughter would eventually take off, my little one would take, take off her diaper and like it would be loaded and, and she would just spread it all over her and there would be hours before I went in to care for them.